Test, test, test. Okay, yeah, that shows up great. Aw. It's going good. How about yourself? Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so we're going to get started here in about 10 minutes. Uh, while Scott's giving his presentation, we ask that everybody who's viewing in the voice channel uh, mutes their self. And uh, you can participate in chat in Discord here, uh, in the text chat, in the general channel, or in the presenter Q&A channel. Uh, or you can participate on Discord, uh, not Discord, on twitch.tv forward slash uh, IGDA underscore Ann Arbor. And you can see uh, chat there with everybody else as well. So there's a lot of options. <laughs>
And if I ask a few questions before it all starts.
community announcements. Does anyone have anything that you'd like to share? Uh, there are there have been a number of game releases this week. Um, oh, I'm hearing my own voice. Oh, because I'm listening to the uh, I'm listening to the uh, the Twitch. My fault. My bad. <laughs> All right. So, does anyone have anything they want to share? Uh, any roles they want to advertise? Any projects they want to shout out? Any events that are coming up? Uh, since I was off my game, on my gameway, uh, go for I, it. I posted this to the Michigan Game Dev thing, um, but Unity just announced that all educators can get a free license for Unity Pro, uh, and they also seem to have uh, uh, licenses for universities that are free as well. So now students, educators, and universities can have free access to Pro and have a collab group of up to five people, which is pretty useful. That's fantastic. That is super um, awesome. Uh, if I recall, the collab limit used to be three. It was. Which, you know, if you've got teams of four, that's a, a disappointment. Yeah, um, it's three It's three for regular people for, for the basic free version. Uh, they give you, like, a version of, I think, teams advanced, but only up to five people. But still, that's better than three. It is. I believe it also allows you to take away the splash screen, the Unity splash screen that appears before your game launches, mm -hmm. which is pretty neat, more professional. That'd be great, yeah. All right. Well, we've got an announcement from Stardock. They have announced Gal Civ 4, and they have some positions still open. So if you have not gone over to Stardock's website and checked out their careers page, I strongly encourage you to do so. And also, if you scroll up in the IGDA Ann Arbor Discord, all the way up to the Looking for Work section, or the Job Posting sections, I believe, uh, I think I've linked to the Stardock career page. I did. So feel free to check that out. Um, they have awesome opportunities available there. Um, Michigan STEM Forward Initiative is in full swing. I know a lot of studios like myself are currently looking for interns. So if you are a current student or have graduated recently within the last 12 months, you are eligible for the Michigan STEM Forward Initiative internship program. And I strongly encourage you to reach out to studios who are participating and to take a look at those job opportunities. And you can find out more about it by looking up just Michigan STEM Forward into Google. It's the first result, nice and easy. Um, on the other end of that, if you have not checked out the michigangamestudios.com database put together by Austin and a few others in our community, it is a phenomenal resource to see some of the local studios and what they're making in the area and get connected with them. Speaking of getting connected with them, if you have not checked us out yet on Twitter, make sure that you go and do so. We're also active on Facebook and right here in Discord. Right. Oh, oh, the Twitter oh, account is incorrect. Brody. That's I so sad. The creative director at... um, double underscore, I believe. Yeah, it's the double underscore now. It's no longer IGDA2 official. We are IGDA2 Ann Arbor again. <laughs> so I think it actually matches our Twitch link. Um, But yeah, if you have not checked us out yet, we will update that in the resources section on our meetup web page um but yeah on that end there's a couple of uh if you're a student and you are a 3d artist or a programmer my company is currently looking for both a 3d generalist as well as a programming intern on our current project goblin forge which is a vr simulation and ga uh, simulation and fantasy game uh, and we are also looking for multiple different uh, positions here in the next couple of months for our upcoming title in Unreal Engine 5. And if you have not heard yet, Unreal Engine 5 is out in early access, and I strongly encourage you to take a look at it. It is super cool, and I'm having a lot of fun with it. Um, Austin, did you have any other announcements? Yes, I do, actually. Uh, let me go ahead and see if I can share my screen really quickly. Okay. Yeah, I'll click right onto it. This has been a fantastic, fantastic couple of weeks for our community, uh, seeing the release of a number of games, several of which you are going to hear about today and learn a little bit more about. Let me see if I can share my screen really quickly. Uh, the first is Mayo Force's Insect Adventure. Uh, if you can see this over here, um, it is a really, really, really cool kind of Metroidvania-style game. Uh, it is uh, relatively cheap. Uh, and uh, I recommend you pick it up. Uh, we'll be hearing about that a little bit later today during our 8 p.m. community show and tell. Another fantastic, fantastic game from our community, Aerial Knights Never Yield. Uh, this was created by Aerial Knight, 
uh, and uh, uh, who's out of Detroit, uh, and it is a fantastic, beautiful, kind of Infinite Runner style game. It is released to a lot of different platforms. It was published by HeadUp. Uh, so please give this project a, uh, a look if you can, okay? Another fantastic game that released uh, this uh, previous week, I believe, was Flyover Games Wave Crash, which there's a very good chance you've seen this at conferences uh, via uh, maybe uh, LTUX or Yumicon, a fantastic, innovative kind of puzzle uh, 1v1 fighting game. I recommend you check it out. It's very addictive uh, and uh, in support all these fantastic local games. Speaking of recently released games uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, are fantastic and I recommend you check out, today's uh, industry guest, uh, industry lecture is Scott Brody of Heart Shaped Games. He's going to be giving us a talk uh, and a, a big Q&A on their game, We Are the Caretakers. A really, really cool and very kind of socially impactful uh, game about kind of leading a squad uh, to stop poachers, uh, to protect wildlife, uh, to uncover some really cool mysteries, all wrapped up in this really, really cool kind of RPG, RTS style. It reminds me a little bit of XCOM, uh, but you'll be learning a little bit more about that in just a bit. Please check out that game. Um, Corbin, a little bit earlier, mentioned the Michigan STEM Forward program. This is a new internship program for our state uh, that essentially pays for half of an intern. If you are a startup, if you are a company, a game studio, an XR studio uh, that wants to get interns, fantastic, high quality, impactful uh, teammates uh, on the cheap, then essentially the state will pay for half of your intern's salary for you, which can really, really help stretch your budget if you're low on cash flow. If you are a company, uh, please head to annarborusa.org to find this. Uh, if you are a student, you can register for this and get access to a huge library of internships and companies looking to hire your talent, okay? So please take advantage of this opportunity uh, so that we can continue to create really cool programs like this. And just to jump in real quick, it is super easy from a company standpoint to get started and get rolling on this. There's very little like red tape to deal with. Uh, for us, it was really quick. We sent an email off and they got us the information that we needed to fill out. I think all in all, the whole process took me 30 minutes to get approved and get my stuff up on that website. And it's been it's been a really great experience. All right. So I believe that's just about it. Um, a quick reminder of the structure of these meetings. From 7 to 8, we'll have our industry guest lecture. And then from 8 to 9, we'll have five-minute show-and-tell slots where we'll be hearing from local studios essentially showing us whatever they want to show us, okay? Um, now, I have a question for you as we get started here. Does anyone remember a little game called Aegis Wing? Does anyone remember this game? It was a 2007 game, I believe, on the Xbox Live Arcade, just as that service was launching uh, and really kind of proving the way for indie games. There was one game on the store that was free, and it was awesome. And as it turns out, it was made by three interns, one of which is our guest today, Scott Brody. Uh, he was with uh, Microsoft and Xbox, I believe, around the 2007 timeframe. Is that correct, Scott? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're bringing me back. <laughs> <laughs> A fantastic game. I remember, I remember uh, playing through it. Um, it had a really cool mechanics where you, it was multiplayer. You could combine with your teammates to form a much more powerful ship. Created in about three months uh, by three interns. Very impressive stuff. Scott would go on to create heart-shaped games in Chelsea, Michigan, uh, which is a really, really cool studio kind of focusing on social impact. They've made fantastic games like Hero Generations, uh, and their latest project is We Are the Caretakers. And with that, thank you so much, Scott, for joining us. Love hearing about these projects. Yeah, thanks so much for the nice intro, and thanks for having me. Um, it's uh, great to see a uh, pretty nice uh, turnout here for the Michigan Game Dev Group, and I've uh, missed you know meeting in person, but I'm glad we can at least uh, connect this way. So, um, yeah, I wanted to just kind of briefly give an overview of how our recent um, early access release has gone and, and a little bit about the development of the project. And then the hope was just to uh, open it up to questions and see what you're interested about, whether it's about um, We Are the Caretakers or any of our other games or just game development in general. Uh, so uh, yeah, Austin, you did a great job of 
introducing me. Um, uh, just a, a few other details that you didn't hit. Um, we've been around for about 10 years now. So I, I left Microsoft Game Studios after four years of being there uh, on Xbox Live Arcade to uh, start my own company and go indie. And um, we've developed a number of projects. They, uh, they usually ended up being around you know, two to four people uh, at most. And so um, after, after releasing a number of those smaller projects and kind of seeing how uh, sort of games were getting more competitive, uh, the indie pop apocalypse was uh, in full effect, um, we kind of uh, found an opportunity that fit, uh, or so we thought, um, the market to kind of scale up our, our operation a little bit um, and maybe go bigger on our mission, which is to create uh, meaningful and memorable uh, indie games. Uh, so with that, we started We Are the Caretakers about um, three years ago now to the day, and um, we released uh, last month into early access in April. Um, so the, the premise of the game um, is uh, fairly unique. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what it is and then kind of go back to where we started. So it's a uh, sci-fi squad management RPG where you're managing... Uh, an ensemble cast of characters to protect uh, your planet and an endangered wildlife from sci-fi poachers and eventually you find out um, an alien uh, invasion. Um, this uh, idea started from sort of a unique thesis. Um, we, um, we actually got into contact with a number of um, wildlife organizations early on through um, some of the folks who helped uh, provide some funding and um, uh, just did some deep research with them and 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 kind of came at it from a couple angles. One, could we create um, a game about this subject and not only just make a game like an you know an, an educational game, but could we make a commercial indie project that's interesting but could also bring awareness um, to this topic of of animal conservation and, and poaching um, and also uh, hopefully have some impact through um, giving to a charity as well. There have been a lot of games that. Um, have tried to do one or the other, you know, they've given to charity, but the charity has nothing to do with the game. It's just sort of a, you know, a, a, a great cause to support. That's, you know, something different. Um, and likewise, um, some games have kind of dealt with difficult topics or real world topics, um, but maybe have either taken the educational route or, um, you know, some, some other paths. So that, that was kind of where we started and very quickly, um, you know, we, we were looking for sort of a fantasy setting and, and kind of, discovered through some iteration with um, some of our main collaborators, um, Anthony Jones, who was our artist, and Xavier Nelson Jr., who was our narrative director, um, landed on sort of this Afrofuturist world that um, felt uh, authentic to um, the landscapes where a lot of the um, people we talked to were working in. Um, and, and overall, just was an exciting theme, you know, having just watched Black Panther and, uh, you know, some of the, the books I've been reading um, just felt like a great fit in, a, in an exciting, unique world that really isn't seen in games. Um, and um, so, so I feel really, um, I guess, proud of the, the creative development on the actual game of developing this world and developing uh, a gameplay concept that sort of stemmed from this real world thing, but then quickly, you know, tried to figure out what the you know, the gameplay elements were and the systems that made up this real world topic. And so I think where we landed, um, it's debatable whether it was the right right thing, but I think synthesizing that into something that's um, exciting and um, maps to the actual strategic landscape, um, you know, I think was successful overall. Um, and I'm not sure, Corbett, if you're running the B-roll or now or, um, or not, but, um, you know, if you're not familiar with the game, hopefully um, that can give you a quick um, idea of what I'm talking about. Yeah, I have your uh, one hour long stream currently playing. Okay, wonderful. Real. Yeah, so um, and just quickly, not to like uh, get too in the weeds, but the game sort of combines the uh, strategic layers at a, it's sort of like the forty thousand foot view where you're in your HQ, um, you're recruiting um, new characters, you're organizing them into up to nine squads, you're researching new technologies, etc. Um, you then send your squads of caretakers out into the field to manage um, and, you know, track your animals, track poachers, work with local communities 
et cetera, in sort of an RTS of pause field. And then when one of your, when one of your units um, runs into a poaching unit, um, it goes into a turn-based RPG combat. And our, our uh, desire was to kind of, again, mimic the challenges these real world rangers uh, and conservationists faced um, at all levels in the micro and the macro. Um, I wanted to talk, I just have some notes here that I'm going through. Um, you know, as I was mentioning before, um, this is kind of the biggest project we've done to date. And I definitely experienced, um, you know, some growing pains as a studio. Um, so we, we went up from that aforementioned sort of two to four number to eight to 10 at our height. Um, we also, um, you know, had folks coming in and out of the project at various phases, you know, when it made sense, some people for pre-production, some for, uh, late production. Um, and I think, you know, my, my background at, um, Microsoft was in game design and production. So I definitely have experience, you know, with producing, um, games and running teams, but, uh, I do think the you know, one, one of the main lessons I've learned uh, kind of coming out of it is uh, I should definitely, uh, you know, if we, we try to tackle a project of the scope again, um, you know, build in budget for a couple other layers between sort of running the studio, doing marketing and doing some contribution on implementation and production and, and, and all the things that usually go into any team are kind of uh, magnified when you also have people management and, um, you know, sort of these bigger um, bigger campaigns and, and, and projects to, um, to run at a given point. Um, and so I do think that, you know, af after a lot of kind of uh, starts and stops, you know, we, we kind of figured it out, um, but it was definitely um, very different um, overall compared to some of our smaller projects. Most of those other projects were 2D, very systems driven, um, replayable um, sort of in design. And this was a 3D, um, you know, multi-layered systems, uh, we have a full narrative with uh, 15,000 words or more, if I'm not mistaken, in our script. Um, you know, a slightly larger budget for marketing and, and activities, which I'll get into here in a second. Um, and so, um, yeah, again, just the the differences in scale are are useful to to mention here. And uh, you know, in the Q and A, I can definitely go into some of the specific challenges. Uh, the other big challenge, obviously. Um, that no one could really account for was the pandemic. We've had speakers talk about that, but um, you know, as the the game rolled on and we got into kind of our our last year of finishing, you know, we hit the pandemic and it sort of dramatically altered any sort of plan or schedule we we had made before. Um, so I had my you know I'm a, I'm a dad, so I had a a son at home, you know, every day with no daycare. Uh, trying to run a studio at the same time and, and also make sure he got what he needed. Um, you know, all, many of our team members had the same challenges with, with, with their families and, and disruptions. Um, and so at, at, at a certain point, um, one of the many reasons why the, the schedule ended up taking a little bit longer was we just decided to stop and say, you know, let's not force this um, into our original plan. Let's, let's reassess and just kind of slow down and, and you know, even with that, I think we still ended up um, releasing earlier than perhaps we should. Um, but it was definitely, you know, a, a big wrench just from the, obviously, you know, it's, it's terrible in all the, the ways it is, but from the, the development standpoint, um, you know, it was definitely a, a challenge that um, I hope we don't have to face again <laughs> and, uh, you know, can, can find uh, processes to kind of build in buffers for any of those kind of major events that might uh, make adjustments. The, the one thing that we, you know, I will say that was a benefit for us is that we were already a remote studio. Um, we have been a remote studio from the beginning. So we were already set up and kind of ahead of the curve and that from that standpoint in terms of our coordination, but um, you know, it, as, as much as you can be prepared, um, it was just, um, you know, it, its own set of um, additional variables that we didn't need in our, in an already complex, um, endeavor. But, um, you know, one of the, the things that, you know, going into the project was just, I, I felt like from a, um, you know, we, we can get into the game design stuff, but I guess one of the things I wanted to talk about was the, uh, you know, thinking ahead and trying to plan about what do we need to really stand out 
in, as a product and how to market it and how to do things that maybe um, will give us an advantage um, as we go to try to build a community and to stand out. I think our game and our world um, that we've built definitely helped us at least start a conversation. A lot of the press that we ended up getting uh, definitely seemed to uh, come from the fact that we have this unique premise for a game and that we had this uh, charitable element. Um, I guess I, I haven't spoken specifically, specifically to that. Um, so we actually are giving 10% um, of our revenue to uh, WCN, which is Wildlife Conservation Network, uh, and they have a rhino recovery uh, fund that's a part of that, that they're directing those uh, funds to. And obviously our game sort of revolves around protecting a sort of rhino-like uh, sci-fi creature called the Ron. And so that was a great fit. Um, and um, yeah, that, that, that's one element, you know, uh, we, we had hoped would help us uh, make, perhaps get some additional press or things like that um outside of games press but the games press themselves actually were um you know good about that so that among all the other the parts of our game you know i think was a success from that standpoint of generating interest um but we tr we also tried a ton of other things um things that in the past we haven't really had a budget to do some were from luck some were from uh again just kind of building in experiments with with some of the budget we had so um just to go through a quick list we announced our game at pax east 2019 with an announcement trailer uh we returned in um 2020 um where we initiated like our first beta um we hired a pr team stride pr to work with us and try to like help offload a little bit of the that kind of big list of things i, I would be handling um it turned out you know to be great in some ways but you know it Again, this is something I could go into um, a bit more if you're interested, but there's still, you know, a lot of management and, and work I had to do. It wasn't just sort of like, hey, you guys do everything for marketing. You, you know, they need the, the input of the game team. So um, that was an interesting to learn because none of these things I had done before in any of my projects. Um, as I mentioned, we ran a beta program uh, trying to pull in some of the ideas that uh, Mike Rose um, suggested. Where, where um, for his company, No More Robots, a lot of times they sort of run a beta program to help build their community leading into a launch. Um, we uh, were in multiple Steam game festivals. We uh, were a part of the Escapist Indie Showcase, as well as later on the Mix Game Dev Direct. Um, we uh, paid for a trailer, which is not something that has happened in the past. <laughs> I've always made my own trailers and websites and all those types of things. Um, we even by suggestion by our PR team, uh, we made baby Ron plushies, two of them and, uh, did giveaways, um, you know, and, and through all this, we were covered by, um, rock, paper, shotgun, IGN. We were actually just in edge magazine, um, this month, uh, which I haven't actually had a chance to see. Apparently it just went out. Um, and, you know, we had a lot of good tweets for, you know, we had good social media campaigns and things like that. Um, and I guess uh, I, I say all of this <laughs> because uh, our, we launched into Steam Early Access and mm, at least at this point, uh, we can talk about all the different factors. Um, the launch has not gone well at all. <laughs> so it does not seem to have uh, made an immediate impact. Um, there are a lot of... Um, uh, there are a lot of reasons, you know, why I think early access, uh, wasn't like the big event that we had hoped for. And I'm still hopeful for, um, how 1.0 can go. Um, but you know, immediately, you know, it didn't work out to sales. Um, and I think, you know, again, just to quickly go into some of those things, I think we had a couple technical issues. Um, I think there are a couple of features in the actual game itself that weren't, um, fully baked that you know we could have used another month or two to avoid that but you know our our initial thought was well the game's in a pretty good state it's been showing well at these shows and and in our steam festivals so you know we can work out some of those uh kinks as we go through steam early access and um you know i i in hindsight i wished i would have gone back a little bit and uh just uh had some of those things addressed ahead of time um and then i guess 
you know, lastly, um, the only other thing I can really point to is that maybe the game isn't a perfect fit for streamers, which is where I think for some of our last games where we've seen kind of big um, growth moments or, or, or things that actually translate to, to sales, you know, were, were these events where we've had big streamers uh, cover the game and, and the, their fans kind of uh, come in and actually um, buy the game. But from there, you know, there's a lot of open-ended questions, you know, of what, what, what could be uh, hindering that is, you know, is the game a little too weird? Is there um, too many layers of gameplay that, you know, maybe RTS turns off some people, maybe turn-based combat turns off people, um, you know, who's to say? You know, the, the interesting thing is our reviews have been almost entirely positive. Um, if there are, you know issues it's usually a technical issue not a gameplay issue so um you know it's 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 an interesting experience to um have put that much time into something and to um get to a release point where um it doesn't kind of work out but um you know my my perspective um on things at this point is that we are in early access and we have um a lot of future points here to um recover um one of those things is that uh, we are working with Xbox, um, and they've actually um, helped us with some of the um, uh, porting options. And so we're obviously going to time our 1.0 uh, release on PC with our release on on Xbox. Um, we're also, you know, we're not we're not going to announce any other platforms, but we hope to be on a couple of other um, PC sites and things in the future. So we, our goal in the short term is to. Um, uh, work on those additional platforms, work out the uh, additional features and technical issues, which we've done a good job, I think, um, quickly resolving a lot of those things now post-launch. But, um, you know, we need to create new events to get people to notice those things. Um, and, you know, I guess just a couple other things um, that are potentially out there are, again, uh, trying to build in some more streamer-friendly uh, features and modes, um, things to get people to be more interactive, like renaming characters, or, you know, maybe you all have good ideas of how we could um, help with that, excuse me. And um, the other thing is uh, localization. Um, you know, right now we only released on Steam and we're only released in English. And we basically got that um, ready to go in a, in a week or two here with um, six different language translations. So um, not completely um, without hope, but it is instructive, I think, in a lot of ways to um, think think about um, what the reaction is and what are the things really worth investing in to, you know, that things that move the actual needle uh, in terms of kind of building the game commercially. Um, so um, again, I kind of just wanted to kind of lay that out for all the folks who've asked me, you know, how, how did launch go or, um, you know, what went into this game and so forth. And um, that's kind of where we're at. And I think, um, yeah, I, I, I'm happy to kind of share more insight into this that could maybe help you on your uh, projects. Awesome. That was excellent. Thank you for sharing everything with us. Uh, I saw that there was a question that got asked about localization, but you answered that right there at the end. So I think that one was covered. Um, I guess I'll start us off with a question. Also, everybody who's in the voice channel now, uh, if you guys feel like unmuting and asking questions as well, that is totally viable. That's more than welcome. Um, but I'll start off. Uh, so with uh, your guys' market research, did you guys look into like which countries and demographics are more interested in RTS and this kind of turn-based styling, or was it more like America focused? Yeah, I, th I think, uh, oh, sorry, am I, I'm still unmuted correctly, yeah. Um, so in general, um, Steam and PC is a great platform for strategy games. Um, we had a number of sort of competitive games that we looked at that sort of presented a case for how an indie um, RTS or indie um, strategy RPG could be successful. Um, I don't want to single out too many games, but you know, just as a, as an example, um, there's a game called Northgard that's um, out there as sort of like a Viking uh, RTS sort of builder thing. Um, there's also um, sort of roster management games like Darkest Dungeon um, and uh, all the games kind of in between that blend genres um, that you know were successful. We're from indie teams about our size 
and um you know again we uh we felt like the audience could be there um who knows what variables there are there um that cause a difference right like maybe those teams have built built in audiences some of it could be um you know something like north guard's more of a city builder so maybe um our game lacking sort of that construction city management simulation piece is, is what what differs there um etc so we we did some research ahead of time to see like there's comparables and we did see that you know um countries like germany and russia and um for our game specifically um brazil um th those all seem to be places that might um appreciate this type of game potentially awesome that's excellent uh, but, it, but it, it hasn't proven uh, necessarily <laughs> at this moment, but we don't have the localizations out either. So right. um, who's to say um, if those audiences are just waiting or, or not? Right. Uh, there was another question asked in Twitch about uh, how do you feel that this game is not a good fit for streamers? Like in, in which ways? Yeah, I, so I think right now um, the, the core mode that we direct you into is a story mode. And so I think some streams uh, we found actually do like sort of the role play piece of it and, and reading the text and going through the story with their audiences. Um, but I think a lot of um, a lot of the like more successful games that are in our same genre uh, are more into like the systemic route of things and, and maybe a little bit of like the roguelike, um, replayable, unpredictable uh, components of things. We have a mode called survival mode that's like that, but I haven't seen a ton of streams um, like that. So it's either uh, a failure of what our mode is, uh, lack of discovery of what that is. Um, but I think that's that's kind of like the first piece of it. And then I do think there aren't a ton of um, interactive components, like I mentioned, like, uh, you know, way, ways for people um, in the chat to be invested. Um, there's one more thing that, that I'm thinking about. Um, uh, what was it? Oh, I think the the speed, the pace of the game sometimes, uh, I think maybe doesn't lend itself as much to streaming. So, um, like the the battles themselves, while there is sort of an auto battle mode, um, doesn't get used as much in in sort of the the plays we've seen. Um, and so, uh, perhaps just like things take a while, and and it doesn't kind of allow player um, streamers to progress as much to where they want to continue. Excuse me to make um, you know more videos of it. Okay. Uh, we've got a message from Sir Snipe asking, how long did you st spend in the pre-production pre phase and how close to the current build was the original GDD? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think in some ways we've kind of uh, started and stopped and, and gone back to the drawing board a couple of times during development. Uh, I think the first pre-production phase was probably six to nine months actually of of both technical investigations as well as uh, gameplay investigations. I think we spent the most time trying to sort out our kind of unique encounter system because we were trying to build in a component where uh, not every encounter is about sort of an aggressive, violent um, resolution. So we were trying to create a balance between these aggressive and diplomatic um, paths. And so all the many iterations of of how that could go and, and how to make that work and get players to understand it, you know, just took a lot of time. So I would say that on certain systems like encounters, we sort of halfway through development kind of reset and tried a different path and, and that sort of thing. But um, the, the short answer, which I did not give, is probably closer to um, that six to nine months in, in pre-production. Awesome. Uh, so we got a message from Jeremy over at MSU. Uh, have you advertised at all in the magazines based around conservation or wildlife management? Somebody spoke at Indicade last year and talked about how advertising their World War One game in a World War One magazine generated a lot of buzz in that community, more than they would have gotten from advertising in a game based magazine. Yeah, that's a great tip. Um, and I think so. What what I'll say is that we did start out by trying to. Um, connect more with those conservation audiences. Um, and I think we've been successful in some ways. Um, the charity we, um, we partnered with has done a great job on uh, their social media and things of that um, 
type to kind of connect us with those um, audiences. But I do think, yeah, maybe some direct advertising or just some, uh, uh, yeah, press in in those non gaming um, outlets could could go a long way. And I think that's going to be a part of as we get closer to 1.0 and telling our story because uh, uh, of something we want to try. And I, I mentioned that because there is a piece of this that we didn't really have a chance to put a good package together for. But you know, in our research, we took a trip, you know, to um, to real locations and like oh, saw awesome. people in the field and and um, you know all, all those conversations. I, I think there's a way to um, present that that would be interesting to people and maybe uh, get them more invested in the game. So uh, I think we're just looking at ways that we could, um, yeah, ways to to package it and present that as we get to the 1.0 um, launch. That's awesome. Yeah, the, just traveling to locations and stuff like that is so amazing. Um, working with some film guys recently, I've heard about some of their crazy adventures over over in Africa and looking at some of those con- conservation stuff. Uh, Sir Snipe asks, so what did you feel was your late, uh, largest constraint during development? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I do think we, we did a lot with a little, and I, I hate to say that because, you know, I think even compared to my other projects, you know, we, we, we had a lot more funds and a larger team, but I think, you know, uh, for example, like most of the art, like all the characters in the game, most of the UI was all done by one artist. Um, he's incredibly fast, incredibly talented. Uh, Anthony Jones, uh, he used to be a former Blizzard Cinematics artist, and he's he's great there. But I do think there was definitely, um, it just took us a lot of time to develop uh, that content. And eventually what we the way we solved that was to not do everything custom. So th- big items like our character designs, um, you know, some critical icons, some critical cinematics were done in house, but we quickly moved to use asset packs for like all of our environment trees and things like that, that didn't need to be custom. And that helped to kind of help speed things up. But I, I would honestly say the, the real answer is um, uh, programmers um, and just, being honest, we had a small programming team and um, what has ended up happening is a lot of that has come back on my <laughs> shoulders to kind of like, as much as I would have liked to have just been like uh, design and a little bit of gameplay and being able to handle sort of like the the high level production stuff, um, ultimately like to help address all these systems we had to do, I've had to be more hands-on um, in programming to kind of fill those gaps of our of our team so i I would definitely say programming on a project like this where there's so much to do and especially as you get into like not just gameplay things like hey we're we're doing multi-platform development um we want to add controller support we want to support all these different screens all all these things that come with like a a full-on commercial project product um you know just takes a lot of people's time uh and so i think that was kind of if I was being honest, that's my biggest constraint. And, you know, the, the unspoken thing there was that, you know, programmers are some of your more expensive folks. So it's hard to really ramp something up, uh, up like that, um, to the degree we needed to. Yeah. Um, okay. The next question we have is from Jeff. It's a little bit larger, so bear with me for a moment. Um, something I've really enjoyed in RTS strategy games are a wide variety of cultures, civilizations, and races. In terms of this game, it seems that there are a few kinds of characters, but it also appears that on the surface they're all pretty much the same race. Uh, Usually this can add a little bit of replayability and strategic involvement. Have you considered this kind of feature, and would it be a uh, contribution to the streamer involvement? Diversity lends a bit of excitement in cases. Additionally, have you thought about creating a wildlife-based mode where you can attempt to fight the poachers back, or would that be too controversial? And have you and your team discussed those types of aspects? Yeah, so there's quite a few things there. So one, I would say our, our game is uh, is more of the of that latter element. So it's about sort of literally battling the poachers. Um, obviously, it's it has a diplomatic resolution system and things like that, but fundamentally, um, you know, you are confronting them sort of in the field. Um, I think the the way I have looked at it, but perhaps it's the the wrong way to look at it, is um, like we would we would love to expand the game to have additional like full on factions and completely different 
um, sort of gameplay styles and character sets. Um, what we have is a giant tree of character uh, paths for you to take. Um, so there is some replayability from that standpoint. Um, my, I, I guess that's that's an interesting point. I, from my perspective, we do have multiple factions in the game uh, that you experience sort of as you get farther along. Um, but yeah, that, that is something to consider is do we take the sort of traditional RTS path and offer these sort of like different sets of um, caretaker type factions and, and that allowing you to go through it. So um, it's interesting to wonder if if the issue is a content problem. And I, I don't think it is, but that's interesting to consider in terms of like player expectations. Like they look at an RTS and they're looking for the very clear, hey, there's four four groups here. And so that's like the value perception or whatever. And so maybe there's something there to that. So so thanks for that kind of perspective as a, as a RTS gamer. <laughs> uh, our next question is from Austin. So with so much to manage and so much going on, pandemic, family, et cetera, what technique or habits did you employ to maintain your discipline, productivity, and health during the development? Um, I think I could have done a better job, <laughs> but I do think... Um... I do think that uh, making sure that my team did not experience those same uh, sort of pressures um, was kind of my main focus at all times. So making sure that my team was um, never crunching, you know, had clear goals, had, um, you know, lots of flexibility in the schedule so that they didn't feel like if, if a life event came up or something like that. Um, that they couldn't address it. So I think that was kind of the um, the main focus. And as as the pandemic came in, just sort of relieving ourselves of the sort of external constraints because things were so unpredictable, uh, you know, they, they are still now, but even more so in the beginning, right? Um, it was, um, you know, a little more unpredictable about, for example, when we'd be able to go to events and that type of thing. Um, so I think it was largely just that, is trying to just roll with it. Um, and, you know, when, when you have a defined budget, you know, that can be a challenge to do just to say, hey, we need to slow down and, and that type of thing. But thankfully, we had good partners and, and things like that that were understanding and, and just wanted the game to um, be the best it could be. Um, you know, as a remote team, this is even uh, more challenging because you can't like physically go check in with uh, with someone, you know, so it's a little bit harder to do those types of things. Um but uh, you know we've we've built systems to you know like like whatever uh, production systems right of 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 communicating with each other to kind of uh, get there and I think we did uh, you know as well as we could um, given the circumstances but I do uh, I do want to say that like work life balance is something that um, you know I'm working on and and as we've now finally launched into early access like making sure to recognize that you know the game's always going to be there there's always going to be something I could fix uh in the game and so not um you know uprooting my life and and the the schedules of our family um to try to like just get that next thing into the game we've we've i think we've worked out a good schedule now and are just trying to slowly do the work um and when when it's ready it's ready that's awesome uh end of phones has another question for you and this is kind of back to the art creation section that you were talking about uh, how much did it cost to get those uh, minor slash set dressing assets that you've kind of created, like percentage wise of your budget? Yeah, I mean they were. Um, I, well, percentage wise, I mean I think they're 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 you know a rounding error, um, which is interesting, right? Because you have things like the Unity Asset Store, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, other packs like that. I think the bi the biggest sets of packs that we ended up grabbing were. Um, obviously environment packs that, that sort of fit our mold 3d packs, um, uh, visual effects, uh, um, packs, because uh, obviously we have so many characters in the game with so many abilities that, uh, there was just a huge need for effects for all those abilities. So, uh, definitely didn't have the, the time or budget to kind of hand make all of those. So I, I kind of built a library of effects and kind of customized them to what we needed. Uh, and that seemed to work out really well and was very cheap. You know, a lot of, a lot of great packs are out there for maybe, you know, 10 to 30 bucks for, you know, significant numbers of things. So if you spend a couple hundred dollars on a bunch of asset packs, you've got a pretty complete set to work with um, compared to, you know, what you would, you know, if you're paying people 
correctly, you know, for their time, uh, that's, that's very, very minimal, mm -hmm. um, by, by comparison. No, that's awesome. I, uh, feel like too often for indie development, people avoid the asset store as if it's like the stigma behind it. So to hear it's being used like that and you being used well, that's awesome. Um, then we had a question from Josh asking, what was your most painful cut from the game feature wise or content wise? Yeah, that's a really good question. There was a lot of cutting that had to be done. Um, the nice thing is that it wasn't so painful because we knew we were going into early access and, and the way we kind of looked at it, um, although, you know, there, there's some like minor regrets of like, oh, I really wish this was in there. You know, it becomes, you know, your post-launch update contents and you kind of have this nice sort of list of like known things that are 90% there that we can build an update around. So we knew we wanted to have a lot of post-launch uh, content and so I'm excited to kind of get these things in. I think the biggest thing that isn't in the game that we haven't really like announced as a thing, but I think it's anybody who's played the game knows that this is probably going to be there is um, a full sort of like shop in the headquarters with supplies that you can equip to your units and things like that. And we, we kind of just pared that down to a minimum. So we're hoping to kind of build an update around like this, this cool um, shop system that will kind of give you different options in gameplay, but also like other things to spend your, your coins on. So I think that was the biggest like component of the game. The other thing that, you know, I really would love to get into the game, but again, you know, at this point where the game's at uh, and our budget, I don't know if it's in the cards necessarily, um, but to have multiple species to protect. Um, mm -hmm. So right now we, we ended up focusing on kind of one core species uh, that you're focused on, uh, but we would love to, you know, if we could, uh, build a bigger following, kind of expand that and kind of give you uh, more things to care about in a map and also just give us another sort of platform to talk about other like real world species that are also endangered beyond sort of like these rhinos that we've uh, focused on. That's awesome. Uh, Pat White says, nice, the game feels very cohesive. So that's a nice thing. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. <laughs> um I just got to say, too, I've, I've really enjoyed watching this uh, live stream that's kind of playing as B-roll footage and kind of getting a like overview and insight into the game as well as we're talking about it. Because as we talk about some of these things, I'm seeing them pop up as well. So <laughs> I think that was a uh, B-roll was a great idea. Uh, Josh has got a question for us asking, uh, are there any opportunities to develop a, a relationship with any wildlife that you're saving in game? Assuming. Yeah. So. Uh, that was definitely a big part of what we wanted to do in the game is uh, not just treat them as sort of like a, a resource or something that, um, you know, to, to not not abstract kind of the animals. So uh, in the story mode, at least, um, very early on in the first mission, actually, you find an orphaned uh, Ron uh, and they actually become a playable character in your party. So you're actually uh, bonding with this uh, baby uh, Ron and they sort of change over time throughout the story. So we kind of use that as that vehicle to kind of um, build in more of that like emotional, uh, um, more direct kind of connection with the animals that we want uh, players to eventually feel if they're not already animal people. That's awesome. I actually think that's in the uh, back center there on the live stream currently. He's one of the uh, equipped party members. Oh. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so I'm not seeing any other questions. It looks like somebody's typing, but I mean, overall, this has been a wonderful presentation and I just, the game looks excellent. Yeah. Um, thanks. I mean, I, I, I do want to just say if you, if you don't mind, um, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we obviously love for folks to, um, to grab the game and join us on the journey. You know, it's def as I've talked about, there's definitely ways we want to improve it and, and it's, there's still some rough edges right now, but, um, yeah, we, we really want to find out what people like about it and what they're expecting and we want to deliver on on those updates. Um and then yeah, I just I do want to say like I'm I'm available. Um if you if you want to join the We Are the Caretakers Discord, I th I think we have the like the the invite up where if you could just go to discord.gg slash we are the caretakers, you can join our community there and um, you know, continue the conversation with me. I'm I'm in there every day with devlogs and um, you know updates and working on the roadmap with people. So we, we would love to have you there. And, and, and outside of that, um, I, you feel free to message me if I can help with any of your games or any advice, that type of thing. I, I, I'd love to be more part of the community. I, I, you know, juggling a lot, but, um, you know, it, it's something that, uh, I really enjoyed, uh, being a part of before and, and would, would love to help where I can. Yeah, that's awesome. 
uh, it's always useful to have somebody with some good experience helping out. Um, Austin, if you are around, could you share that link to the We Are the Caretakers Discord in the presenter Q&A and in the Twitch stream, if possible? Uh, and then we have a message from Jeff as well, and he says, I briefly touched upon this earlier, uh, asking about the wildlife-based mode, but to expand upon my question and Josh's question, do you plan on creating a playable wildlife mode where you can attempt to develop a secondary heartfelt adventure to really drive home the point of activism with a supporting wildlife uh, conservation effort? Interesting. So, so I'm wondering if the question is about um, rather than being potentially so um, strategy focused to be more um, like, like something that's more about like, just like protecting and building up an environment of some kind. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think I, I, even if that's not what you're asking, um, I, I do think that um, what we've learned in early access is that there are different audiences who like this. So we, we have someone who's been streaming the game, you know, a, a smaller channel, but um, they come from sort of like a climate change um, ecology background um, and they love 90% of the game. The The combat is maybe um, less their cup of tea. So are there ways that we could offer more of the, you know, direct caretaking um, uh, type of things like nurturing the animals, building up your population, that sort of thing. And I do think that it would be great to... Um, find more ways to either add more modes or customization options so that everybody can kind of uh, find the angle that they love about this game and kind of focus their experience on that. So I do think um, that's in the cards um, as we kind of flesh out the modes and, and offer more options. Um, okay. Do we have any other questions? Anybody in voice chat want to jump in and say anything? looking like we don't so scott i just want to thank you so much again for coming out and talking with us this month and uh again guys if you have not picked up your copy of we are the caretakers make sure that you do that over on steam i've shared the link in the stream it should be shared in the discord as well um we are going to take a five-ish minute break um after this so it's going to be radio silent on the stream so that way i don't have to disconnect and shut off all of my audio um, but after that, we'll be coming back with our community showcase and talking about some community games out there and hearing some of your guys' stuff. Uh, and again, thank you so much, Scott. Thank you for having me. No problem.
I'll let you know when you've got 60 seconds left. Awesome, Alrighty. awesome. So just before you get started here really fast, uh, for everybody who's still watching us on Twitch, we are just about to get started with our community showcase, and we're going to have Insect Adventure showing here first. So let's give Derek our attention. Go ahead. All right. Does that mean I'm ready to go? Go for it. All righty. I'm going to start off showing the trailer for the game. If you want sound, you need to do the window and not the screen. What was that? There's no audio if you wanted that. What would I have to do? You click screen, and then instead of sh uh, sharing your screen, you share the application, which in your case okay. would be Chrome or Firefox, probably. Yeah, OK. I'm sorry about that, guys. Oh, actually, uh, maybe it's no Windows Movie Player. I'm not sure. I can't tell. That's on you. OK, I'll start over. You hear it now? Yes, we can. So, this game was made using Click Team Fusion. I spent about five years working on this, almost entirely by myself, except for the music, which I had uh, uh, I had commissioned a guy named Paradoxygen who is uh, also working on the Oddity soundtrack, if you heard of that game. Uh, it was uh, very heavily influenced from Metroid, but also I really like uh, Hideki Kamiya's games, like Beautiful Joe, Bayonetta, Okami, stuff like that, and that was a big influence as well. Now I will uh, transition into the actual game. All right, so. Well, the story of this game is that there are two little bugs. They are cockroaches named Bugsy and Mayo. And they decide to go exploring in a cave. And then when they're exploring, Mayo gets kidnapped by this lizard man guy. Uh, Bugsy doesn't really have anything to fight against lizard man. And uh, this earthquake triggers anyway. Uh, Bugsy gets hit by a rock. And then he tumbles further down. And he's basically on a quest in the underground labyrinth to find the lizard man rescue mail. Pretty simple story. One of the biggest things I wanted to have for this game is uh, to make it so nothing would ever slow you down. Uh, at least if you know what you're doing anyway. Uh, later on you get a slight ability which helps smooth out movement a lot. Uh, also the uh, game's combat is uh, sort of like a beat em up. We have like full combo attacks. Oh no, it's glitch out. There's supposed to be spiders here. I have to start over again, okay. What else did I have to talk about? Um, 60 seconds. 60 seconds to talk. Um, yeah, the, yeah, later on, you get the ability to run up walls. 
and uh, you also get a uh, Metroid style speed booster and uh, those two abilities synergize really well. It also synergizes with the aforementioned slide and the uh, grapple. And I, uh, I spent a lot of time trying to make the movement really smooth. I had to, uh, I had to enter it on a lot of the abilities over time. Uh, pretty much everything in this game. I actually started when I wasn't really that good at drawing. And I, after like a year or so of just practicing digital art, I looked at the graphics and I was like, yeah, this is kind of crap, so I like redrew almost everything from scratch. Oh, this guy here, he uh, charges at you when he sees you, which is like another system a lot of enemies have. And he's kind of there to teach you that you can attack enemies from behind. All right. Thank yeah. you so much. I've, I've played this game and I, I got stuck partway through it. But it is it is fantastic. It it, it 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 it's just a fantastic time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, five minutes. Five uh five minutes of Q and A, everyone. If you've got questions, post them in the presenter Q and A or on Twitch chat. Starting now. Go. So the first question we have for you is from Pat. He asks, uh, "The movement has a little classic Sonic, but taken to a different genre vibe. Uh, was that what was your kind of inspiration for that? I would say. Uh... Well, honestly, when I started, I really wanted to make something that was uh, like Metroid Zero Mission in Spirit, where that game was like a typical 2D Metroid game, but everything was very refined and very fast-paced. And I wanted to continue that, and uh, when I went back and forth into Zero Mission in this game, I took notes of like what you would... Uh, Took no I took notes of like uh, what made it good and why I enjoyed it, and that developed led to stuff like the slide ability that I mentioned before. I really should have started further in the game so I could show off more of these abilities. <laughs> hey, that's awesome though. Uh, our yeah. next question is from Josh, and he asks, "What else do you have planned for the game?" Uh, what else do I have planned for the game? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, right now. The game is complete, but I do want to. Oh, one of the first, I do have a few projects planned. Uh, the game is designed to be moddable, and I'm going to include some extra campaigns like a pit of 100 trials mode and a boss rush mode. And currently, I'm working on a mode where you play as Mayo, who has to rescue Bugsy, and she has a gun instead of a hammer. Awesome. Uh, we had another question uh, that was, how do you motivate yourself to work on a game for five years? Uh, I want to say the biggest uh, motivation. I like spoiling all this and I about it. <laughs> the biggest motivation uh, definitely came from having a composer give me a song every month or so mm -hmm. and made me go... Yes, this game's getting closer to being completed. I should work on it. And another thing is I was watching a lot of GDC, and they helped me, give me a lot of advice, but the best advice I heard was to never have a 0% day. Like, even if you feel like crap, if you, like, write two lines of code or, like, draw half a sprite, that's uh, better than nothing. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um... Evan asks, how did the marketing go, and how did you try to find your audience? I'm still trying to find my audience the best. I'd actually ask other people that, but uh, the best thing to do would be just look up Metroidvania groups from anything, from Steam, from uh, Twit, and Twitter, and uh, use hashtags when you post, and... Another thing, don't have a 0% day, and that would even include marketing. Like, even if you don't want anything to do with the game, you just uh, uh, post, like, a screenshot or something on 
Twitter or something. That's awesome. Um, some other questions. Uh, oh, there we go. How did you get animations of this quality on cli on cl in Click Team, and were there any uh, constraints to using it? Honestly, the constraints have nothing to do with graphics. Uh, the animations of this quality just come from practicing digital art for like two years straight. I'm still practicing digital art. I want to make some really nice stuff in the future, like Streets of Rage 4 quality. It's a good choice. Good aspirations. Yeah. 60 seconds. Uh, how has sales been going so far? Just because um, I know that you're out and going. How was your day one looking? Pretty good? Uh, it was all right. Uh, a lot of the people who said they would buy it is like uh, friends and coworkers. And I sold 30 copies so far. But the last few days in a row, I hadn't gotten any sales. Mm hmm. Uh, I know right now it's my first game. I still have an audience to build up for myself. And uh, I just have to keep forcing myself to say uh, that I just have to keep forcing myself to be patient. I'm awesome. really glad I got this opportunity to show this game to a live audience and talk about it, even if it wasn't perfect. Um, just let me know when the time is up. Uh, if there's another question, I'll answer that. Yeah, so it looks like we have one more from Snipe. Oh, okay, last one. Do last it. one? Okay. How much research into bug life did you do before starting this? Actually, this is a game I had in my head since I was like 10 years old. And around that time, they still had zoo books. And zoo books got me really fascinated into insects. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it oh. definitely is. Um, thank you. So I'm guessing the time is up then? Yeah. Yes, All right. Is. Derek, thank you so much for showing this off. Uh, this is uh, an obscenely awesome first game. It's it's hard to believe this is your first project. Uh, and I, I, I mean, uh, let's get a few iterations, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, um, I, I hope everyone watching will consider picking up a copy. It's a very, very good time. Yeah, I can send you a link to the Discord, and that will have links to story pages and stuff on that as well. That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah, post it. Uh, if you can, post the link in the presenter Q&A. Okay? Alrighty. Well, uh, see you guys, and thanks for watching. Thank you, Derek. Take care. <clears throat> okay, next up, we have one Corbin Reeves. Oh, am I next? Okay. Corbin, I mean... <laughs> There he is. All, All right. right. Are you ready? You've got five minutes. Yeah. I mean, let's just jump right into it. Let's make it easy. Let me share my screen so that I can show off. Um, you guys are getting an under the look, uh, under the hood view at my slightly more chaotic than I'd love it to be Google Drive. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about a few different things today, but I, I wanted to start off here with uh, some visuals. So unfortunately, we had some game builds planned to be shown off today, uh, but we had a client phone call that went long and I jumped into this meeting and forgot to remind Connor to put the builds in the drive for me. So we don't have those builds to show off today, um, but I'll talk about those games anyway. Uh, so this card art here is actually for a board game that we've been designing just on like in our free time. It was something that kind of came as a random project. We had a 2D artist kind of on retainer. And we thought, you know what? We made this little card game for fun in the office just as a break. Let's take it further. Let's actually do something with it. Um, because, you know, that's what you do with your free time and money is just spend it, right? Uh, so we started making card art. And uh, it had to do – it kind of spiraled out of control because we started calling it and making it around these goblins because we were making a game called Goblin Forge. And so we started imagining, like, what would these goblins do? What would their lives be like? And then it kind of came to this whole board game deck builder kind of thing. And so we've had some phenomenal art made by our artist, uh, Abby. And she is just absolutely phenomenal. 
Um, <laughs> so she's had a lot of fun coming up with some of the items for this game. Um, and it's been a really cool experience kind of all around uh, with some puns and some cool cards and things like that. Uh, other news, we've got our next project coming out is a project called Age Craze. Um, that will actually be going live tomorrow is our hope. Uh, it'll go out on Android at least tomorrow. Apple will probably give us a run around for a few days and then it'll go out like Monday or something like that. Um, I usually avoid Friday releases, but our client is super stoked, super happy, and has claimed to have put in like 30 some odd hours into it and says that it's good to go. And so we'll trust him. Uh, but Age Craze is a age guessing app. So if you ever like scrolled on the internet long enough back in the early 2000s, you would find this thing where it flash a picture to you and kind of have you guess about them, rate them, judge them, something silly about them. Well, our client's idea was to take that to another level and make this application where you share photos of yourself and guess each other's names. His goal was not to create some crazy new experience or drive a whole new market, but really to just capitalize on the free time people have and the interest that we have in kind of judging each other's ages and just in general. Uh, and it's actually created a relatively interesting experience for us. Uh, when we first got the contract, I actually told our client that I wasn't too sure it would do that well, and I wasn't too sure that we were the, the team to build it for him. Uh, but he kind of convinced us to do it. And then from there, we've actually had a lot of fun with it. We found ourselves kind of spending some time playing with it. So once that comes out, we'll share that out and kind of show you guys what we did. It is entirely a free application. It's something he wanted to make, throw some ads on it. Just if people enjoy it, uh, the ad revenue will help them out. If not, they can pay to remove them or they can just ignore them. <laughs> uh, other than that, we have another game that should be coming out here in a week or two called Dungeon Burst. Uh, it is a project that Connor actually built. Connor is our lead programmer. He built that his senior year of college. We've kind of repurposed his senior thesis into a game that he pitched and wanted to make a fun bubble shooter mobile game. And uh, that's actually where we picked up our 2D artist, Abby. So whether the game is a success or a failure, I call it a win because we got an amazing team member out of it. Um. I also wanted to talk just ever so briefly about our next project. Uh, we are doing, and I can't show too much about this, but I can talk a little bit about the experience for you guys. Um, we are doing a Unreal Engine 5 project uh, called Ravenwood Acres. It is if Harvest Moon or Stardew Valley met a old school game called Fantasy Life, for any of you guys who played that back in, I think that came out 2008, 2009? No, maybe it was 11. Um, either way, we're genre bashing a farming life simulation genre style game with a role playing RPG game. Uh, and it's something that we kind of came up with and have been sitting on for a while, workshopping and designing for a while. But we recently decided to uh, jump in and chase down some investor funding. And we've had a lot of fun doing 60 it. Seconds. OK, uh, we've had a lot of fun doing it. And creating this document that has been kind of the bane of my existence, uh, it turned out to be a like 58 page document, but we've gotten some good results. Now, not to like toot our own horn about the project or anything like that. What I usually really care about is how it can help out the community at large. So one of the things that we've done is we've partnered with a business consultant firm and a few venture capital firms to try to find some outside of the gaming industry investor groups who are interested in games. And throughout our time pitching and chatting with them, not everybody's interested in our product. Totally fine. Our game is not everybody's cup of tea. Um, but we've been kind of compiling this list so that when we kind of finish our journey through funding, we would love to reach out to other indie teams that are putting together projects and trying to get their stuff off the ground and really looking for funding. Um, because a lot of investors are trying to diversify and capitalize on this space. And so we thought our best way to do that is let's make a use case. Let's do it ourselves. And so I've had some amazing experiences with uh, Bradford Carlton. Um, he's our business consultant, wonderful dude. Um, him and his wife have been phenomenal and such a supporting uh, team with us. And we've had so much fun doing this. All right. All right. So five minutes for Q&A. Go ahead and ask away. So I'm not sure... 
will have too many questions because it's kind of an all over like studio overview. Um, but if I see any, I'll respond to them. But otherwise, I did want to talk about some really cool stuff that we had kind of come up with this. And I know it's a little hard to see. And I'll see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Um, that did not do what I wanted it to do. Um, but we basically took some time to find some market research. Uh, yes, you can marry people in this. And no, you cannot marry your crops. Good questions. <laughs> uh, our market research was something that I was actually dreading. Um, and so we reached out to somebody on Fiverr whose information I still have. They've done wonderful. Um, and we are very excited about it. And they've, they did this all in about two weeks for $700, which is significantly less than our uh, $5,000 offer that we received uh, to do our market research. And I'm pretty happy with our results. So if anybody's interested in market research, I can connect you with our gentleman who did this. Um, he did a phenomenal job, and I found Fiverr to be a wonderful resource. Uh, question, how is developing our VR game going? <laughs> yes. Uh, um, developing in VR has been a ton of fun. Uh, I am not really focusing on it anymore. I do a lot of design and stuff like that, so I've created a ton of system specs and design documents, and I iterate on them pretty much every other day. Um, so I don't think about it as much as I should because it's my 6 a.m. to like 9 a.m. stuff that I do. But uh, Connor and them have had a blast in it. So while I'm hunting our next project, they've been kind of putting the finishing touches on that to get it out into uh, early access. Um, and I got to say, I'm very happy that we chose Unity to do our VR project in. I love Unreal, but gosh, I uh, love Unity's uh, VR projects and setups like that. Uh, Pat, uh, I'd love to talk to you about the process of building and maintaining a studio next time I see you. Please, yes, I'm always open. Um, so I will post something. I think I still have it saved. I posted it in uh, Twitch, and I'll post it in the Discord general chat. Uh, it is my Calendly. Uh, it sounds silly to say I started using it while I was uh, teaching last semester. It has made scheduling events in my life so much easier. My fiance can see my calendar. My team can see my calendar. Uh, nobody bothers me or ske double schedules me anymore. So please, if you want to talk with me, that is the best way to get me in a Zoom call for an hour or more. I'm always happy to talk, always happy to go over design documents, talk about plans, talk about studio stuff. I love to chat about games. This is what I do day in, day out, and I wouldn't change it for anything. Uh, did you find using a college made story easier? Uh, to remake, because it was better to start with something than starting over. I don't understand the question, Snipe. I'm so sorry. Did you, oh, sorry. You, you were discussing seconds. when you had, um, one of your last stories you had made because one of your uh, employees had made it, I think, either in high school or oh, college. Yes. Did you find... Go ahead. No, um, yeah, it was... <sighs> Yeah, starting with something was definitely better for us than starting with nothing. We already had some art to go with. Uh, we had some initial design frameworks to go with. Um, it was interesting and challenging uh, in the sense that we were kind of pivoting it from a PC focus to mobile focus. So we had to redo some of the UI. But other than that, I mean, we had a lot of fun with it. Um, the story for the game wasn't really existent. It was mostly gameplay. Uh, the guys who made the game were almost all engineers. And they just were like, hey, this would be fun. And then they just made it. And I love those kind of projects because they give you so much wiggle room and things that you can kind of add to it post that you can have some fun with. Um, uh, how do we estimate our sales? So estimating our sales was a huge challenge. So what we did is we took a look at some of our competitors in market. And we had to unfortunately use the uh, box litter method and um a super cool tool that's names escaping me that i paid for that does a bunch of like scraping from sales and reports from steam and nintendo and xbox and playstation to get number of units sold and like like their estimate of lifetime units sold so we were able to use those estimates using the box litter methods and using some publicly made available data to estimate our lifetime sales to pitch to our investors, um, which was fun. Um, I feel like they were overestimated personally. Um, I also know that the investors won't watch this video today, but I personally feel like the sales are a little bit overinflated, but the accountant that we were using used a lot of this stuff, put together the uh, 
sales numbers and said, this is what we're pitching with. And that account was approved by the venture capital group. So um, I think we can hit it personally because I think we can make a good product. But uh, All right. standing in a room is always scary telling large sales numbers or optimism. what I consider large. Right. Optimism. I'm an optimistic person, but you have to convince somebody with money to be optimistic with you. That's a hard sell. <laughs> Bingo. Bingo. Okay. All right. That's that's 10 minutes. Thank you awesome. so much, Corbin. Yeah. Uh, and just as a one final thing, if you want to chat with me about anything, please feel free to make use of that Calendly uh, that I posted in the Twitch chat and in the general chat on Discord. Always happy to chat. All right. So now that the presentation is winding down. I think we're at like 30% of our initial uh, amount of people. Oh, I'm sure. For our final presenter, which happens to be me. Oh. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, the spoilers won't get as far. Okay. So we've got five minutes for showing stuff off and then five minutes for QA. You got the clock, Corbin? I do. Let me pull that right. up. <laughs> you are good to go. All right. So let's do it in three, two, one. Okay. Uh, so right here is something that you saw earlier in the presentation, if you were here at the beginning. This is the MichiganGameStudios.com database. Uh, we've recently added a lot of new data to this. Uh, not only are there now more than 75 studios that are pretty well researched and verified, uh, but each studio also has their kind of existence date. I was able to get this based on uh, business filings through the kind of online Michigan business entity uh, system. Uh, and we also have defunct dates, though fortunately not too many of the studios that we put on here are defunct. Um, we have estimated sizes uh, for every studio that has them. We now have itch.io pages. Here's the one for Finji. Bingo, right there. We've got Steam pages. We've got Twitters. We've got Discords. We've got, uh, for some people, we've got Patreons. Uh, we've got Ko-Fi's. We've got all sorts of different stuff. And if you ever felt like you, 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 know, you were alone making games in the state, or that maybe you didn't know where you should be recruiting uh, or who you can go to talk to for good game design advice, good playtesting, feedback. Well, here's your database, michigangamestudios.com. We update it about every week, uh, and uh, there are a lot of studios here. Hey, there's Mario Force. Hello. Um, if you go to the very bottom, you can request a change. You can request a change to your entry. You can request that we add a studio that we don't know about. In the future, we're going to be adding more deluxe controls to the system. So for sorting, so you can sort by alphabet, you can sort by region, you can sort by other stuff. Uh, but until then, please just enjoy seeing all these games on here. And please let us know, using this uh, form down here, uh, if there's a studio around that we don't know about yet. Thank you all so much for helping us put this together. Okay, uh, so the next thing that I want to show you is, uh, let's see here. Okay, up click. Uh, so a while ago, I showed you a little bit of information on a project called Greek Tragedy. Now, let me go ahead and uh, change my screen here so that you can see it. <sighs> okay, here you are. Okay, so uh, we've got a little bit of footage, a B-roll. Uh, this B-roll footage uh, has no audio because I recorded it while Corbin was talking during this event. And so we would hear his voice if I had done so. Uh, and unfortunately, horror kind of lives and dies by its audio, so you'll just have to pretend that it's a little bit spooky right now. Uh, this is Greek Tragedy. Uh, it is a game about a college student uh, who has discovered some, you know, some pretty scary things are going on. Uh, there are some cultists, there are some ancient, ancient rituals going on, uh, and there's now a lot more content than there used to be. So this is a game that's modeled after Resident Evil, and the early Silent Hill games. It is, I think, what some people will consider uh, very kind of stiff and a little bit um, old feeling, archaic. It uses tank controls, it uses fixed camera angles that swap as you move around the space, trying to give you the best shot. Um, it has an inventory system, it has limited inventory space, uh, and it has a ton of puzzles. Um, uh, the game has a number of kind of we don't want to just recreate a classic horror game. Uh, we want to create uh, an experiment with some, some design elements, too. I won't necessarily tell you what those are, but there are some unique things going on in this project uh, that I hope you'll be enjoying in a month or two. Uh, the game currently takes about 90 minutes to get through. 
Uh, and the playtesters who do those 90-minute runs tend to have a pretty good time as they do so. But one of the best things about this genre of classic old-school game is that if you know what to do, and if you have planned your route and studied how to progress through the game, you can get through it in about five minutes, right? However, if you don't really know what's going on, if you're trying to figure out the story, if you're trying to solve puzzles, if you're interacting with stuff, uh, then it can take much more like 90. <clears throat> so that is part of the fun, and you are rewarded in this game for moving fast, uh, though I won't show you exactly how. 40 seconds. Anyway, uh, this is pretty much all I wanted to show you. I just captured some footage. There are a lot of items in the game. Uh, there's an inventory system. One of the cool things about this is that just about every interaction in the game, whether it's an animation, whether it is uh, using a screwdriver to open up a vent, whether it's collecting something, all of those interactions are powered usually by just one or maybe two components. If you want to make something collectible, you know, there's a chair in your environment and you want the player to be able to put it in the inventory, all you have to do is add one single component. That is it. Everything else just works, TM. Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, it's a pretty good time. This game uses a PS1 art style. Not because, time. <laughs> not because it looks amazing, but because it's uh, cheap and efficient and it looks okay-ish. Um, otherwise, does anyone have any questions? Uh, we'll just let the B footage roll here. Hopefully uh, you won't remember the solutions to any of these puzzles. Some of them are, are a little bit devious. So I had a question for you. Yeah, go for it. Are you still actively looking for playtesters? Yes. In fact, we had a playtest. Uh, Nigel Charleston did an amazing playtest uh, this morning. And, uh, and so, yes, we're always looking for playtesters. Usually it's, uh, it's very one-on-one. -on -one, so we will sit down with the person. We'll watch their entire play session. We'll help them if they get stuck. And then we'll go and try and polish those areas. The goal when you're playtesting, at least for us, is we want every player to be able to get... Well, okay, we want about 80% of players to be able to get through the entire game with, with no help from us and without banging their head against the wall too much. This is really hard to do, and it requires a lot of tiny tweaks to, you know, how does the dialogue sound? You know, what does the dialogue emphasize? Uh, where's the lighting in the scene? Uh, you know, is the player blocked from going to certain locations so that they can't get themselves lost or confused? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's just, it, it's... It's one of those great moments in game dev where you're watching someone play through a space and you're asking yourself, why did they play through the space in that way? What is in their head and what tools in my toolbox uh, can we use? Can we use lighting? Can we use a change in dialogue? Can we use a sound effect to draw a player to do a certain thing or to think about something, right? How do we get the player, once the player collects the item or the piece of information they need to solve a puzzle, they won't necessarily know that they now have the keys to the kingdom. And so how do, you, how do you make them remember? How do you tip them off that they now have something that they need? <laughs> anyway, um, so the game's much bigger than it used to be, and I really don't enjoy creating environments at all. So Snipe has been helping me a lot with that. Questions? This is, this is why we wait till the end, I guess. All these spoilers flying everywhere. This, uh, this telescope is one of my favorite objects. Uh, your, your objective in the game is to reach this building. It's the Student Union building. You've been asked to go there, uh, and you're trying to get out of your dorm and get to it. You're currently on the roof. Um, helping the player keep this objective in mind while they focus on a lot of other stuff is a really tough thing. And so we put a lot of hit, hints in the environment, from photo frames to telescopes, to keep the player reminded and looking at these various long-term objectives. Otherwise, they're going to start to feel lost, and uh, it's going to be a, a, it's just going to feel like a mess if, if they don't have, you know, the, the long-term objectives still in their mind. So we've got a question from Mayo. He asks, <laughs> did anything scare a playtester in an unintentional way? Uh, there's one part in, this, in the demo, actually, on Itch that's still here. That's the scariest moment in the game, and it scares pretty much everyone. Um, uh we did have one playtester who was so afraid of everything in the game that like he, he that poster of a crab when he looked at it would scare him uh and that was that was probably i re i really wish i would have recorded that one because that was really just a joy um everything scared him so
So the answer is yes. <laughs> A uh, lot of really positive comments about it. Uh, Pat loves it. Uh, oh, it not, looks great. I'll, I'll have to look. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, uh, I. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the playtesting is really helpful. And any tips on how to make the game look better? I'm an engineer, and so I didn't. I didn't spend like a decade studying how to make things look good. And so I'm still trying to figure out how to really make this uh, this cheap art style click. I think so far you've got it pretty locked down. Like, it looks excellent. Just all around. Are there any other questions? You've got 60 seconds. I don't uh, see any questions, but I'm yeah, not really I'm looking. Yeah, I not any others. Okay, well. Mayo's typing. Hold it. I'll i got hold 60 it. seconds. Yes. <laughs> not... Feels bad, man. Everyone's gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a question. It's just more of an observation, but my favorite thing when I see playtesters do things is like if they find a glitch or have some kind of strategy or something that actually gives off a really positive effect. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? I want to keep that in the final game. Yeah, for sure. So it, you can't see it in this footage because I know how to avoid it, but one of the longest standing bugs in, our, in this project is if you hit a certain object just right, you'll hover, you'll go into the air, and what the logic that we have that tries to attach you to the ground and keep you from like, you know, going off slopes and flying into the air, it just doesn't work. And I'm not sure why. And the way that Unity's rigid bodies work is very inconsistent uh, sometimes. So, in other words, if you if you hit the angles of certain objects on the ground just right, one of those is that chair. If you hit that chair just right, you go into the air. That means you get on that at the table. And if once you're on the table, you can get onto the ledge, and once you, and as soon as you're on the <laughs> ledge, you can escape, and you can just start sequence breaking like crazy. Um, we'll have to remove I, it though. So after a <sighs> after solving a uh, bug with enemies flying through walls in my game, I'm willing to believe that any sort of collision problem is a floating pointer number. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Where is Jason when we need him with his deterministic physics engine? <laughs> that's right we can give us two years and we'll we'll eliminate this bug we the bug won't even be possible anymore yes and it sounds like you should just remove the chair <laughs> well actually the funny thing about this chair i can't i have no idea where snipe got this model of a building but this this model of a building is is one model including the tables the ground the chair and i'm not comfortable enough with blender to go in and like chop it out Oh, I see. So, so I that's really, uh, like, okay. Like yeah. you're talking about how like you can grab a chair and put in your inventory. I was assuming oh, that they're all like different yes. objects. Yes. So, so okay. So the chairs you see in the interior are their own objects. These chairs are special. Oh. They're part of the building. So, so let's so, just blame Snipe then. Yeah, it's your fault, Snipe. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's we'll it, figure it out. Yeah, we don't need the chairs separate, separated. We don't need that right now. We, we're just putting colliders uh, on the chair to keep everyone away. <sighs> anyway, that's it, everyone. Hey, thank you so much for the feedback. Um, if you haven't played the demo of this game, search for Greek Tragedy itch.io uh, and uh, let us know what you think. Uh, if you're interested in playtesting, we really do need playtesters. Uh, so send me a DM or something uh, if, you are, uh, if you're available for that. I really appreciate it. But we, we only really want people who are somewhat experienced with the Resident Evil 1 slash Silent Hill, mm. like tank controls and fixed camera. If, if you hate that, there's nothing this game's going to do to win you over. So, okay. Thank you. All righty. Well, thank you guys so much for coming out this month. It was awesome. Scott did a phenomenal job. Our presenters did a phenomenal job as well presenting in the community showcase. That said, if you don't want to hear just me and Austin and, well, Mayo helped out this month, but if you don't want to hear just me and Austin give another update, make sure that you guys sign up for our community showcase. It is a wonderful time to show off what you've been working on in the last month, and it really helps to pressure you to kind of like get something done, make use of your days and kind of get it in front of other people. And it never hurts to get feedback early and often. Um, otherwise, thank you guys again so much for coming out this yeah. month. Austin? Yeah, everyone, I just posted the form. I just posted the form in the presenter Q&A. And... Oh, he just missed it. 
And I'm, I'm po yeah, I misclicked. And I'm posting it in the general chat too. Okay. So yes. like Corbin said, please sign up and uh, and show us your cool stuff. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, we will see you all back here again next month. I am looking forward to it. And make sure you guys can always reach out more often than that. Okay. Have a good one. Take care. Bye-bye.